A few years ago, I was on location shooting some outdoor video for the fuel project when this happened. And that was only the beginning of the troubles that day because after being eaten alive by midges, and I got so eaten by midges that day, later on my camera also ended up in a puddle of water and it died. It was water damaged and it wouldn't turn on, it couldn't be repaired, it was just, it was done, it was kaput. So that day, although I went out to make a video, I came back with nothing other than a sore backside, lots of midgy bites and a broken camera. It was just one of those days, unfortunately. However, that day turned out to have a silver lining because that was effectively the beginning of my discovering photography. The old camera was just a camcorder and it couldn't shoot still photos, but the new one was this, and this one could. And I was really excited about that because I'd always been keen to try photography. And sure enough, when I did try it, when I got my hands on this, I found that I kind of loved it. And I started taking photos with this pretty much all the time. I would do fuel videos with it during the week and then at the weekends I'd start taking off on road trips and adventures and try to find epic landscapes to take photos of. And I actually found these road trips had a really beneficial effect on my sense of well-being. I really began to notice that. As Al Mill said a couple of videos back, doing YouTube can actually be a very isolating experience. It isn't very glamorous doing this. I spend a lot of time alone indoors making these videos. And so the idea of grabbing a camera and getting in the car and just having an excuse to get outside for a while, it really had a lot of appeal for me. I'm lucky I live in Scotland too, which has some pretty good nature. It's a very scenic and beautiful place, and it's also small, so if you drive in any direction you soon come across something amazing before long. In one direction you're at the beach, in another direction you're in the mountains, in another you're in a picturesque village or even a city, and the whole place is littered with castles and forests and lochs. It's just a very scenic place. And so this really has become almost a bit of a lifeline for me to go on these photography adventures. Whenever I'm feeling cooped up, I just go away and spend some hours in the outdoors taking photos, stuffing my eyes with beauty and finding awe-inspiring sights. And again, I've noticed that when I do that, I always come back feeling refreshed and invigorated and feeling happier about life, feeling ready to tackle the next fuel video. And so to this day, I do this. I go off on road trips and adventures as much as I possibly can to find the most beautiful and the most awe-inspiring things that I can. And I've come to think of these adventures as being a really important aspect of my mental and emotional well-being. And it turns out there's some science behind what I'm feeling. It turns out that experiencing awe has been scientifically proven to make us happier. It's only in the 21st century that scientists have really started exploring the emotion of awe. It's quite a new field of discovery. The founding fathers of the science of awe are considered to be Dacher Keltner and Jonathan Haidt of UC Berkeley. In 2003, they produced a paper that is considered the foundational document of all modern studies on the issue. Now, first of all, in their paper, they tried to define awe, and it's actually not that easy. We all know what awe is, of course, because we've all felt it. Maybe we've had goosebumps on our skin during a musical performance or a play. Perhaps our jaws have dropped at the stunning view from a mountain peak. Perhaps we've stood before a vast ocean as the waves raged and felt overwhelmed by its relentless power. Perhaps we've experienced it at a sunset or while listening to a rousing speech or while standing in front of a great work of art or while witnessing a stunning sporting achievement. Whatever the context, we have all felt these moments of absolute wonderment, these special moments that make us feel glad to be alive. Keltner and Haidt tried to define that feeling of awe by saying that it always consists of two qualities, vastness and accommodation. Vastness simply means that we perceive the thing that we are encountering to be greater than ourselves in some way. That could be in a literal sense, like with a mountain range or an ocean view or an expansive desert, or it could be metaphorical, like with a celebrity or someone else that you've always admired. Someone we consider to be greater than us because of their talents, achievements, or position. For example, one may say they feel awestruck when meeting royalty or a famous sports star. Accommodation, on the other hand, simply means that the experience causes you to reinterpret the world in some way. It changes you. You have to assimilate what you're experiencing into your mental structure in a new way. 
For example, when you stand on that mountain range and see the vastness of the peaks around you, you suddenly feel smaller and more humbled. You have a new perception on the world around you and your place within it. When you witness your favorite sporting hero doing something extraordinary, perhaps it changes your perception of what human beings are actually capable of. When you hear a rousing political speech, maybe that causes you to change your mind on a particular issue. Kellner and Haidt say that because of these twin qualities of vastness and accommodation, all can transform people and reorient their lives, goals and values. The dictionary defines awe in a very similar way. It calls it an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration, fear, etc. produced by that which is grand, sublime, extremely powerful or the like. So that's kind of what awe is. And very importantly, experiencing awe does amazing things for us, it turns out. It makes us happier, it makes us humble, it improves our friendships, it makes us more generous, and it makes us healthier. Let's quickly run through each of these benefits. First of all, happiness. In 2018, Keltner's team started taking military veterans and deprived children into the outdoors to give them some awe, to see the effect it would have. And he discovered it made them happier. Here's Keltner talking about it. And that's why with environmentalists in the United States, like the Sierra Club, we've been taking kids raised in poverty and veterans outdoors, as you see in this picture, for a day of, it, of awe, as much as we experience here. And what we find is both for our teenagers and our veterans, drops in stress and anxiety, 30% drop in PTSD symptoms for our veterans, just by a little experience of nature. Stanford University followed up in this and discovered you can feel happier just by imagining something awesome. They asked a group of participants to read a story about standing at the top of the Eiffel Tower and looking over the city of Paris. And they discovered that just asking them to visualize this scene in their heads for 10 minutes was enough to raise their happiness levels. So awe makes us happier. And deeply connected to that is that awe makes us humble too. When we encounter something awesome, something bigger than ourselves, we experience something scientists call self-diminishment or the small self effect. When we look up at the stars, for example, we feel insignificant and humbled by the experience. Remember how King David wrote in the Psalms, when I look at the night sky and see the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in place, what are mere mortals that you should think about them, human beings that you should care for them. Clearly David is experiencing self-diminishment here. He's feeling small and insignificant as he looks up at the night sky. He is humbled by awe. In 2017, Keltner carried out a test in North California to prove this self-diminishment effect. One group of scientists went to Yosemite National Park, where tourists were obviously experiencing a lot of awe in vast, beautiful surroundings. Another team of scientists went to Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco. Now, both teams asked random tourists to draw pictures of themselves. And interestingly, the people at Yosemite drew themselves consistently about 33% smaller than those in San Francisco. And this proved that they felt more insignificant. They felt more humbled. Now, why does this matter? Well, because it turns out that the more humble a person is, the happier they become. See, when a person feels big and self-important and self-absorbed, the things that happen to that person feel big too. A self-absorbed person is constantly concerned with the things that are impacting them at any given moment. And because they feel self-important, everything that happens to them feels important too. Ah, I went to the store today and they didn't have the kind of apples that I like. I can't believe it. They should have the kind of apples that I like. This is an outrage. A guy took the last parking spot at work today. He knows that I normally take that parking spot. This is an outrage. It's just apples. It's just a parking spot. It doesn't really matter. The world's gonna go on. But because it's happening to big me, the problems feel pretty big too. And so people will get stressed about apples and parking spots. Therefore, you will find quite consistently that the most stressed and anxious people are often the most inward looking people. And that's half the problem. They're, they're always looking at themselves and ruminating on their problems, which just seem to get bigger and bigger the more they focus on them. And so to forget ourselves for a moment and to look outwards at something else, something bigger than us, is actually a kind of bliss. C.S. Lewis once said that humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's just thinking of yourself less. And to be in the presence of something vast causes us to forget ourselves. It deflates our ego, we gain perspective, we see a bigger picture in life. And all that is so, so good for us. All of our problems 
suddenly don't seem so big anymore when we look at the night sky or when we stand on a mountain top. In fact, you will find that your most blissful moments are probably those where you completely forget yourself for a moment. And awe has that effect. Final emotion that holds societies together is awe, the feeling of being around vast things that transcend your understanding. Here's one of my favorite quotes on all by, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Out in nature, we return to reason and faith. There's nothing that can befall me. All mean egotism vanishes. So awe kills the ego. It makes us more humble. And that's a good thing for us because forgetting ourselves makes us happier. And it's this humility that also improves our friendships too, by making us more generous and concerned with others. Jennifer Steller and Amy Gordon from the University of Toronto and University of California respectively were part of many of the previously mentioned awe studies led by Dacher Keltner. And they concluded, Feeling small makes us feel humbled, thereby lessening selfish tendencies like entitlement, arrogance and narcissism. And feeling small and humbled makes us want to engage with others and feel more connected to others. All of that is important for well-being. Humble people are nicer to be around and they make better friends than self-absorbed people. And we kind of know this from experience. In fact, when the scientists went to Yosemite and Fisherman's Wharf, they did another interesting study that day. When talking to the tourists at both locations, they asked an actor to come along and spill some pens on the floor nearby. And a curious thing happened. The people at Yosemite stopped to help pick up the pens for the stranger far more often than those at Fisherman's Wharf, and they spent more time doing it too. Actually, Keltner references that experiment in this next clip. So at Berkeley, Paul Piff and I took undergraduates out for one minute, they looked up at a science building or in another condition. They looked out into this beautiful stand of eucalyptus trees, tallest trees in Northern California in terms of eucalyptus species. And what we found is one minute of being outdoors led people to feel less entitled, less narcissistic. They needed less money to do this study. And in this figure right here, they actually helped a stranger pick up some pens that they had dropped. They became more altruistic. Awe promotes generosity. So awe makes us happier, makes us more humble, and improves our friendships by making us more pro-social and generous. And then finally, experiencing awe makes us healthier too. A team of scientists at UC Berkeley conducted a study on 119 students where they tested for the presence of interleukin-6 or IL-6. IL-6 is a marker of inflammation that's been linked to chronic health problems and stress. It's also been identified as a marker for coronavirus, as it happens. The team discovered that the more awe someone has experienced in the previous month, the less IL-6 they had in their systems. In fact, they concluded there are few things more effective at reducing stress levels and susceptibility to chronic disease than deliberately exposing oneself to awe. That mountain vista, that ocean view, that orchestral crescendo that brings you out in the goosebumps, it's not only making you happier, it's protecting your health too. So in my lab, we've been interested in the health benefits of awe, and what we find is that regular experiences of awe and wonder and reverence quiet the body's inflammation response pictured here. It's produced by the cytokine system. It produces flu-like symptoms. It's a pathway to heart disease and diabetes. When chronically activated, awe quiets that response. The bottom line then here is to pursue the awesome. And of course, even though science has only been telling us to do that for the past 20 years, the Bible's been telling us to do that for thousands of years. It's been telling us to pursue and give reverence to the most awesome thing of all, which is God, the creator of this whole thing. The Bible often tells us to stand in reverence and awe. In Hebrews it says, Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping him with reverence and awe. Now again, does the Bible say that we should stand in reverence and awe to make us happy? No, that, that isn't the focus of the passage. It tells us to do it because God deserves it. It's, it's the righteous thing to do. It just so happens that if we do that righteous thing, it will make us happy. Science is proving it. And indeed, the Bible tells us often that encountering God's creation, what he has made, will help us to connect to him with awe. 
See, as Christians, we believe that God has revealed his nature through what he has made. Paul writes, For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky through everything God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So the Bible encourages us to encounter creation, what God has made, to know more about his nature. Earlier we mentioned King David looking up at the night sky and being filled with awe and reverence. And the Bible is filled with examples of that. People encountering the beauty and the vastness of creation and it leading them to awe and worship. Here are just a few examples of people in the Bible looking at creation and it causing them to feel reverence and awe for God. Those who live at the ends of the earth stand in awe of your wonders. From where the sun rises to where it sets, you inspire shouts of joy. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. I have heard all about you, Lord. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. And Christians have been doing this ever since, looking at creation and being inspired with awe for God, the one who made it all. One of the greatest hymns ever written is How Great Thou Art. It was written by a Swedish man called Carl Boberg as he walked home from church one day and was inspired by awe, by the vastness and the beauty around him, to praise God. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand has made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. You can feel the joy in every word of this hymn, it is so good to find awe and to feel small in the presence of the God who made the universe. The Bible has been telling us to do this for thousands of years and God has been inspiring people to do this for thousands of years. And science is just now discovering that it makes us happy. Actually, there's just one more cool thing I want to show you before we finish this episode. In this episode, we've seen that awe produces happiness or joy, humility, friendships, generosity, and health. Now, with that in mind, notice what happened when awe fell on the early church. Let's read about it. The Bible says that when a deep sense of awe came over the early church, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. And the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So all fell on the early church and then what happened? Joy, humility, friendships, generosity. The Bible's been telling us about these truths for thousands and thousands of years. Now you might be thinking, is this the first joy producer that we've examined in this series that doesn't involve discomfort, sacrifice and discipline? Could stuffing your eyes with wonder even be seen as a hedonistic activity? I mean, sure it takes some discomfort and discipline to get up in the morning to go see a sunrise or to hike up a mountain, but isn't this an essentially hedonistic thing to stuff your eyes with beauty and vastness and wonder? Well, not really, because remember, as you pursue awe, you become smaller, you are humbled, your ego begins to die when you encounter things that are greater than yourself. Awe reminds us of our impermanence in the grand scheme of things. And you'll perhaps notice that awe also triggers the previous three antidotes that we've already explored so far in this series. Awe triggers better friendships and fellowship, and that's what we looked at in the last episode. Awe triggers gratitude and worship, that was two episodes ago. And awe triggers generosity and giving, and that was the first antidote that we looked at. So all of these things kind of trigger each other, and the joy is multiplied in each one. Again, I encourage you to put this to the test. Don't just watch this video and then do nothing about it. The blessing only comes to those who obey. Start deliberately looking outside of yourself for things that are greater than you. Allow your ego to be destroyed in the presence of vastness. And from humility, let generosity, gratitude, and pro-social behavior flow. The Bible's always said that awe's a good idea, and now science agrees. Lose yourself in something bigger, and at the end of it, you're gonna be happier.